Great. Well, again, welcome to the webinar hosted by Women's Voices for the Earth and Planned Parenthood of Montana. Um, today we have Alexandra Scranton, who is Women's Voices for the Earth Director of Science and Research, um, on to present about the links between toxic chemicals and reproductive health. We are also very lucky to have Elizabeth Arndorfer with the Reproductive Health Technologies Project. We'll talk about how the uh, organization incorporates toxics into the work that they do. I'll also be um, speaking about a project we are doing with Planned Parenthood of Montana to educate women about the link between toxic chemicals and the reproductive health and to also raise this issue among our elected officials. So to start us off, we have Alexandra Scranton. Okay. Thanks, Jamie. Um, and thanks for the introduction. As uh, Jamie pointed out, I'm the Director of Science and Research for Women's Voices for the Earth. Um, and my talk today is, is on the impact of toxic chemicals on reproductive health. And I'm sure that I can't do justice to this topic in the 15 minutes that I've been given. Um, but my, whole, my goal is really to hit some highlights, give you some examples, um, and make a case for why this issue is important and how it's relevant um, to you and, and, and your work. Um, so for those of you not totally familiar with um, the work of Women's Voices for the Earth, um, our mission is to amplify women's voices to eliminate the toxic chemicals that harm our health and communities. And while there are a number of groups around the country who work on eliminating toxic chemicals, we've chosen to focus um, particularly on the disproportionate exposures and impacts that women experience. So we look pretty closely at exposures from things like cleaning products and cosmetics, uh, feminine care products um, on women, and much of what we do naturally relates to reproductive health. Um, this is a main area, it's pretty gender specific biologically, um, and a, an area of women's health that so often gets overlooked and is understudied. Um, so we do our work to try and bring greater attention to this area, to help educate folks, um, and increase the general knowledge base on toxic chemicals and reproductive health, um, while also advocating for changes both at the policy level and for changes by corporations um, in the way that they can make uh, their products so that women have fewer toxic exposures and can be healthier overall. Um, and we certainly believe that reproductive health professionals are crucial voices on this issue um, and can really have a huge impact um, on the prevention of, of toxic uh, chemical exposures. Um, so what are some of the um, impacts of toxic chemicals on reproductive health? Um, very briefly, here are some of the health trends that have us um, concerned. There are these rising rates of disease, particularly in women, that are really unexplained. Things like breast cancer rates, which have risen from 1 in 20 to 1 in 8 just over the last two decades. Um, the onset of puberty in young girls is now occurring at a much earlier age than it was 40 years ago. <coughs> Excuse me. And endometriosis is another example, a leading cause of infertility, and it's much more common today um, than it was 50 years ago. Um, I have another stat didn't actually make it into my slides. Um, it's one I recently came across, and it's a real uh, puzzle to me, not one that, that's being uh, talked about much. The incidence of vulvar cancer has increased 411% between 1973 and two, the year 2000. So it's not a cancer that affects a lot of women, but it's really unexplained and certainly a dramatic um, increase. And these are all you know, largely unexplained phenomena that have been changing um, in relatively recent years. Um, now, what might chemicals have to do with these changes? Well, chemical exposure has also been changing dramatically in recent years. Um, there's been really explosive growth in chemical production in the last 40 years. There, there was, in 1970, a global output of about $171 billion worth of chemicals. Um, and this has increased to over $4 trillion uh, in 2010, the most recent data I have. Um, so it's an increase of more than 2,000% in terms of chemical production. And, and this is projected to continue to increase. So this is really, you know, better living through chemistry. There's a lot more chemicals out there. They're getting into our environment. They're in our household products. And they're getting into our bodies at unprecedented levels. Um, and it appears that we may be getting sick from all of these chemicals. Um, it's certainly hard to prove in many cases. But there's really rapidly accumulating scientific evidence documenting, documenting this sort of widespread exposure to environmental chemicals at levels that we encounter in our daily lives are really impacting uh, reproductive and development health, de developmental health um, in adverse ways. So here's a couple um, examples. Oops, oh, did I miss a slide? Hold on. There we go. Um, uh, so um, 
couple examples of um, chemicals that are, are being linked to reproductive harm. Um, phthalates are one chemical. These are plasticizer chemicals uh, found in vinyl plastics and fragrance, among other things. Um, exposure to certain phthalates has been found to mess with your hormones. This particularly um, affects testosterone production. It's been clearly seen in animal studies to cause feminization of males. Um, as well as uh, other reproductive issues like hypospadias. There's um, limited data in humans showing other sort of subtle feminization effects in baby boys. It's certainly of concern. Um, bisphenol A or BPA is another uh, really good example of the chemical that's found in, in a lot of plastics. It's found in canned food liners, thermal receipts like grocery store receipts. And in utero exposures to high levels of BPA have been linked to abnormal breast cell development, which can increase vulnerability and risk of breast cancer later in life. Uh, there's also some relatively new data on increased risk of miscarriage, so certainly some uh, reproductive concerns there. Lead is another uh, common example, very common contaminant found basically everywhere in our, in our world, um, still also used as a stabilizer in, in PVC plastics and can come out of those. Um, lead exposure in utero is linked to neurological impairments, sometimes severely, um, can cause lower IQs in babies. Um, and then there's also newer data linking lead to um, changing levels of, of um, menstrual hormones, um, which could be affecting fertility. So there's a lot of concern there about um, these exposures. And these are really just um, a few examples. There are certainly many more, and like I said, they're sort of rapidly um, <laughs> accelerating in, in the literature. Um, and there's a like, likely a lot more that are yet to be discovered. And the science is really um, complex. Um, the endpoints are sometimes subtle in terms of what you're looking for. The effects can be intergenerational, and there's still a, certainly a lot that we don't know. Um, the best advice that we feel we can give at this point is to avoid exposures to these problematic chemicals that you can control. Um, clearly, we're not in control of all of our exposures to, to chemicals in our world, but some of them we can control, um, and where we can act, we should. So we think health practitioners particularly are very important voices and very important messengers of this advice to take precautionary measures to avoid exposure to toxic chemicals. So I'm going to talk a little bit about when, um, when our um, you know, when can you talk to, to patients about toxic chemical exposure? And we think there's some, some key windows of vulnerability in a person's life when avoiding exposure um, may have more impact and where this sort of cautionary advice may in fact have more salience and relevance. Um, and these windows can really translate into good opportunities to talk uh, with patients about these issues. Um, so pregnancy is the obvious window of vulnerability. There's so much key development that can go astray from toxic chemical exposure in utero. Um, and this is, of course, a time when women really start to pay attention to, the, to their exposures, and, um, when it's not just their health on the line, but it's you know, the health of their, their baby as well. Um, so pregnancy visits, really important and relevant time to talk about um, toxic chemical exposures. Now, what often it gets neglected is the time period before pregnancy, and this is sort of the preconception period. Um, preconception exposure is really important. Uh, for one, toxic chemical exposures can build up in your body over time. Some of these chemicals have long half-lives in the body, so you need a longer period of time to sort of figure out how to lower these levels um, in your body. Um, exposures uh, to certain toxic chemicals can also have tremendous impact in the first few weeks of pregnancy before you even know you're pregnant, right, before you're sort of paying attention as a pregnant woman. Um, and this is when so much fetal development, early fetal development is going on. Um, so this preconception period for many women is sort of effectively always, um, or at least until you know for sure that you won't be having any more children. Um, because, you know, many pregnancies aren't planned, so we, we really need to, to think about the effects chemicals are having on our bodies um, all the time during our reproductive years in sort of anticipation of having the healthiest um, conditions for pregnancy. Um, a third time when women can be reminded of these issues, when these discussions can happen, is kind of every single month associating these concepts with the menstrual cycle. Um, and this is the focus of our latest campaign, which we call Detox the Box which looks at toxic chemicals in feminine care products. And what I mean by feminine care products are menstrual products like pads and tampons or cups, sponges, um, as well as a whole host of products marketed to women such as you know, feminine sprays and washes, there's powders, douche, lubricants, et cetera. 
Um, the key um, sort of similar factors about all these products, they're exclusively products for women, and they all have direct vulva and vaginal application. Um, the skin of the vulva and vagina is not like the skin on the rest of our body, right? It includes mucous membranes. There's close exchange with blood vessels. These are permeable and absorptive tissues. that have specialized bacteria. There are specialized microbiomes in this area of the body. Um, and unfortunately, not all feminine care products have been formulated with these very special conditions in mind. Um, many feminine care products contain a lot of the same chemicals found in cosmetics that are sort of designed for outer skin. And there's almost no research to, to figure out whether or not these chemicals are in fact appropriate for use on this very specialized area of the body. Um, one huge issue that we're um, aware of is the common use of known irritant chemicals. Uh, this can be preservatives, disinfectants, allergens like fragrances that can lead to um, irritation of the skin. Um, and one issue we've discovered is that there are so many feminine care products, particularly kind of washes, sprays, lotions, get purchased and used in an effort to either prevent or self-treat irritation or itching conditions in this area of the body. So the problem is many of these pro pro products are likely making the very problem they're intended to treat worse, um, given the harsh chemicals that they include. So we've certainly found that discussions around feminine care products and feminine care products use are a great entree into discussing these concerns of toxic chemicals with women. It really resonates with them when you think about what kind of chemicals you're putting in and on such a sensitive part of your body. Um, so that really wraps up my um, very brief <laughs> introduction to, uh, to this topic. Um, so keep in mind there are lots of ways to incorporate these issues um, into regular communications with your patients. I think Jamie's going to be talking about some of the resources and strategies that we've developed here. So I've got my contact information for further questions, and hopefully we'll have time for, for Q&A at the end as well. Thanks very much. Great. Thanks, Alex. And if you do have some questions, if you don't want to um, forget to ask them, you can type them into the chat box. Next we have Elizabeth, who's going to talk a little bit about how this issue can be incorporated into um, reproductive health and justice organizations. Elizabeth? Oh, Elizabeth, are you on mute still? Shoot. Yes, I was. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Jamie, and thank you, Alex, for um, that great summary. Um, for those of you who don't know the Reproductive Health Technologies Project, we are a small advocacy organization based in Washington, D.C., and we're dedicated to ensuring that women have access to the technologies that they need to become pregnant when they're ready and to prevent or end a pregnancy when they're not. And you know, often when we think about or talk about our work, you know, we think about things like the Supreme Court and Roe versus Wade and access to abortion and contraception. We don't necessarily think about how near our apartment is to a freeway or busy roads or what's in our water, our lipstick, our sofas, or the chemicals that are used in our schools and our places of work. But as Alex uh, demonstrated, perhaps we should. You know, as she said, chemicals are ubiquitous and they're clearly impacting reproductive health outcomes from fertility, infertility, fibroids, endometriosis, early puberty, birth outcomes, you know, as well as planting the seeds for later life um, problems such as breast cancer and ovarian cancer. So, you know, reducing our exposure to harmful chemicals may in fact be one of the most important things that we can do to protect our reproductive health and the health of our families and communities. So, right, given the clear connection between reproductive health and exposure to toxins, you know, why aren't more reproductive health organizations lining up to work on this issue? Well, uh, if you've had even, you know, a passing, paid passing attention to the headlines, you know that there's no shortage of things currently on the reproductive health uh, to-do list, right, from fighting off abortion bans to keeping our doors open, you know, in the face of layers and layers and layers of extraneous regulation to initiatives that seek to give embryos 
greater rights than pregnant women, right? And, you know, as Alex herself said, Alex, a scientist, said, you know, the issue of chemicals in the environment, you know, we have to be honest, it's complex, it's confusing, it's overwhelming, right? It's not just one chemical or one company that we could target, it's everywhere. And, right, we've got a lot on our plates. So sometimes it's hard, right, to, um, to go the extra mile. We just want to hunker down and sort of do work on the things that are our sweet spot. But there are very good reasons, um, both practical and philosophical, why reproductive health organizations should engage in this issue. So first and foremost, at least at our HTP, we believe that this is part of our mission, right? We believe that a woman uh, wanting to become pregnant and having a healthy pregnancy is part and parcel of reproductive freedom and rights. And so the fact that chemicals in the environment are impacting that, we believe is part of why we exist and why we do what we do. Second, and you know, I think even more important is that this is a justice issue. Um, so the same women that, you know, are denied access to health care and to abortion and publicly funded contraception, you know, are the same women who are most vulnerable to the chemicals in the environment because of where they live or where they work. Um, and for these women, it's not, you know, reproductive health or exposure to chemicals. It's both and. It's part and parcel of the same thing. And one issue I just wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about is early puberty. So um, Alex mentioned this, right? And um, right, the most recent research on this shows that 25% of African-American girls are starting puberty by age seven. And that's compared to 10% of white girls. And so either 25% or 10%, both are terrible and shouldn't be happening. But that's a quarter of African-American girls who are going through early puberty um, by the age of seven. And you know, so what happens to a girl who is eight but she looks like she's 15, well, she starts getting treated like a 15-year-old, like a teenager. And that's really different than an 8-year-old. And um, she's, you know, uh, she starts to kind of internalize the way people look at her. And as a result, research shows that girls who go through early puberty you know, tend to engage in uh, more risk-taking behaviors, and specifically sexual risk-taking behaviors like early onset of sexual activity, multiple partners, greater um, gaps between uh, the ages of their partners. And so, it, you know, so then it comes back directly to reproductive health outcomes that we work on every day, STDs, um, abortion, and access to contraception. So I just use that as a way to demonstrate how the issues really are connected and how um, women of color, communities of color, are much more vulnerable to these, um, to exposure to chemicals than other communities are. Another really great reason to get involved in this issue is that it is bi or maybe even transpartisan. So I know for myself, when I sit around the Thanksgiving table with my conservative Catholic family, um, it's really easy for me to talk about chemical exposure and what that's doing to reproductive health. And that actually really changes the tenor of the conversation that I can have with them then about abortion and contraception. And the same thing is true with, you know, maybe people in the community and people um, who are making policy decisions. So it's really a way in that doesn't have the same kind of noise that there is often around abortion. Secondly, people support this issue, right? It's as popular as sex education. It's, this is not a hard sell. People do not want to be exposed to chemicals. 
So it's a great issue. People get excited about it. They get pissed off about it. Um, and there is a thirst for information about this issue. And reproductive health organizations are a hugely trusted resource on reproductive health. So it makes sense that there would be information. Um, and then the last point I just want to say is people get really excited, especially if this is, you know, if, if you're a reproductive health organization and you're focused on, you know, the, the abortion and contraception and STDs, and then you talk to them about the chemical exposure, it's sort of like, oh, and people get very excited and activate and respond to that in a way that um, is kind of surprising. So hopefully you've sort of, you know, you're intrigued, you're thinking, well, maybe we could incorporate this into our work, but I'm not Alex, I'm not a scientist, I'm not really even a rabid environmentalist, or, you know, maybe you are a rabid environmentalist, but still you're thinking, what can I do? Well, so I've been working with RHTP on this issue for a number of years, and I wanted to share my advice, which, by the way, I still apply all the time to the work that RHTP does in this area because, yeah, it's an area in which you can easily get overwhelmed. So my advice is start small, think local, collaborate, educate, and activate. So on the start small, um, if you decide you want to get engaged in this area, you don't have to change the world. You know, I repeat, you don't have to change the world. You don't have to, you know, be responsible for getting chemicals, all chemicals out of the environment. Engaging in this issue can start as small as committing to retweeting um, something on reproductive health in the environment once a week, right? So that's as easy as starting to follow Women's Voices for the Earth or HTP or any number of other excellent reproductive health, I mean, environmental health and justice organizations out there and retweeting it. And that helps to educate you. It helps to educate your staff and your members, people who are your supporters. Or invite somebody from a local organization, from an environmental health or justice organization, to talk to your staff at lunch, talk about what they do, or assign it to an intern. We have found that our interns get this issue in a way that um, some of us who are um, older don't internalize quite in the same way. They see the connections and they're really excited about it. So start small. You don't have to bite off everything, but the point is start. Do something. Second, think local. And when I, as I was preparing for this, I think local, at least in my mind, can mean a couple of different things. So you, I can guarantee you that there is something right where you are situated, right where you live or work that's impacting, it's a chemical exposure that's impacting your health, right? So maybe you live in a farming community and um, your clients or your supporters are, have a greater exposure to pesticides, or maybe you live next to um, a refinery um, or a factory, right? Or you live in a community that doesn't have access to fresh fruits and vegetables. There's something right there in your community that you can start to work on. But another way to look at this is um, to think about your, what I call your organizational MOO. So, you know, who are you as an organization? Are you primarily a sexual health organization or a service provider? Are, you know, your clients mostly young women or are they young mothers? You know, what are they interested in? Um, there's a great example from uh, an organization that I'm sure many of you know, Forward Together. They're a reproductive justice organization based in Oakland, and they have a youth organizing uh, component that they've had for years. And one year this group was really interested in this connection between reproductive health and toxics. And so they ended up testing the lipsticks that they use and that their friends and their family members use. They connected with a researcher at UC Berkeley, and they ended up actually um, publishing a peer-reviewed article on this. Now, you know, did they 
change the world with this research and this project? No, but they certainly educated themselves and they got really activated on it, and it was the thing that they were really uh, concerned about. Uh, likewise, with RHTP, when we first got involved, we decided to look at the technologies, right? Technology is actually in our name. So we looked at um, contraceptives. And the first thing we did, there was a lot, at the time there was a lot of um, stuff in the media about how um, estrogen from oral contraceptives were impacting um, drinking water. So we worked with UCSF and got a peer-reviewed paper published on that. And then we followed it up with sort of a broader look at um, trying to encourage uh, manufacturers and developers of contraceptives to think about the whole life cycle of contraceptive research and development. And more recently, we published a report on, um, on condoms and whether or not condoms release a carcinogen, carcinogens called nitrosamines, um, when they're used. But this is just an example, like this issue of green contraception and technology was something that was very much an RHTP issue, and it made sense for us to kind of pursue that area. The next thing to think about is just education and collaboration. So I'm not going to say much on education, except for educating is something that you can definitely do, and Jamie's going to talk about that more. But I really want to focus a little bit more on collaboration, because I know for RHTP, one of the greatest things we've gotten out of um, working in this area are the many incredible partners that, um, we've, uh, that we've gotten to know and worked with over the years. In fact, we have two, member, two board members right now who come directly out of this work. Um, this Earth Kit that's up there is um, a project that we did last year, and we did it with um, We Act for, Envir for Environmental Justice based out of Harlem and Sierra Club. This is you know, not something that we could have done by ourselves, but working with them, we have this great product that helps to educate people about this really important connection. Likewise, the nitrosamines report that I mentioned just a moment ago, we did that with the Center for Environmental Health. Again, couldn't have done it by ourselves, but we collaborated and it was great. And there are lots of really great environmental health and justice organizations who are out there who can work with you um, and can make this um, not so daunting. Uh, and then finally, activate. So when you are educating people about this issue, it is really important to give them you know, something they can do. As Alex said, we can avoid certain chemicals, um, we can choose to you know, buy certain things, but we also know that just buying things isn't going to fix this you know, problem. We really need to get to the um, systemic things that make, um, that make us vulnerable to chemicals. And so for RHTP's part, we've been active for many years on a, in a national coalition to get national chemical policy reform done. Now, I wish I could say, you know, we're going to get that done soon. I think that's probably not likely in my lifetime, but I think there are many other things from the state and local level that you can do, and I think it's really important to get, when you educate people, to have them take that next step, whether it's, you know, um, working on state legislation, like writing, you know, uh, make, taking a stance on state legislation or something more local about getting, you know, certain chemicals not used in our schools anymore. So I think it's really important to have the personal piece, which is what can you do in your own life, but also take it that next step. So thanks so much. Here's my information. I'm happy to take any questions um, after Jamie goes. Great. Thanks, Elizabeth. That was fantastic. And we do have several questions for you waiting in the chat box. So we'll get to those um, at the end in just, in just a few minutes. So I feel my, my short presentation kind of nicely follows yours. Let's go to my slide here. Um, because I'm going to talk about how we partnered with Planned Parenthood of Montana on a joint project to educate women about the impact of toxic chemicals on their reproductive health and also to raise this issue among our elected, official, our, our elected officials. 
and a partnership with Planned Parenthood in Montana, you know, made a lot of sense because of the potential to reach women with important info on ways to re- reduce exposure, you know, via um, Planned Parenthood's clinics. Uh, Planned Parenthood ha- of Montana has five clinics in the state, and they also have the organizing infrastructure um, on, colleges, on college campuses through their 501c4 arm um, that really, um, you know, would enables us to reach more young women on college campuses about this issue. And it's something um, worth, um, worth pointing out is that I think the medical establishment is just becoming more and more attuned to the danger of toxic chemicals, um, the danger toxic chemicals pose to women's health. Um, last year in 2013, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the American Society for Reproductive Health, they released a statement that said, toxic chemicals in the environment harm our ability to reproduce, negatively in affect pregnancies, and are associated with numerous um, other long-term health problems. So it really makes sense for uh, organizations that are doing direct outreach to women um, through clinics, for example, to talk about ways to reduce exposure to toxic chemicals. So one of the first things we did as part of this project is um, we held a webinar on reproductive health and toxic chemicals specifically for clinicians who work at Planned Parenthood clinics in Montana, just to introduce them to the issue. Um, We also wanted to let them know about some of the resources that we jointly produced with Planned Parenthood um, that specifically, um, you know, provide tips for things patients can do to reduce their exposure to toxic chemicals. And the resources you can see are these three um, co-branded fact sheets on the screen here. One is just kind of a general top 10 tips for avoiding toxic chemicals. Um, and we have another one specifically on feminine care products. That's the one on the right. So those are specific ingredients to avoid in feminine care products. And then the middle fact sheet is a um, fact sheet for pregnant women and also women who want to become pregnant on things they should do um, or things they should watch out for or avoid um, as when they're trying to conceive or, or when they are pregnant. So these, will be, these are being distributed in all the Planned Parenthood clinics in Montana. So the webinar, you know, we're able to introduce clinicians to the, the fact sheets and let them know that these will be available in your clinic and please, you know, pass them on to your patients. Um, on the webinar, we also discussed ways to green the clinic it, itself. We had a nurse on from Alliance of Nurses for a Healthy Environment um, to discuss steps clinics can take to reduce toxic chemical use in the clinic. And we also had a nurse from a local hospital um, in Montana who discussed how she was able to get the hospital to phase out of the use of triclosan, which is often used in antibacterial soaps and is a pretty nasty um, chemical. And we really thought it was important to have nurses speak on this topic because, you know, they're seen as peers. And we we received a lot of um, great feedback from clinicians who attended the webinar, and they really appreciated the information. And I actually have, we did record that webinar, so I can send that along to everyone who RSVP'd along to the link to the recording of this webinar. Another really cool thing that we did um, was a pill pack campaign. And um, this was a great way to reach women and what we did is we put a, this is a, just an image of a, a wallet card that we developed with Planned Parenthood. Um, actually, I don't have the version with Planned Parenthood logo on it, but this is um, associated with our Detox the Box campaign. And on the other side of this wallet card, it lists toxic chemicals to avoid in feminine care products, which includes you know, tampons and pads and feminine wipes and sprays and, and douches. And we, <laughs> excuse me, picked a month where these wallet cards would be inserted into the pill packs that were being passed out at Planned Parenthood. And as a result of this, we were able to reach, you know, over 3,000 women with this information. It was just a super cool, you know, way that we could, um, that t- to reach um, women. Uh, and the other part of the project, so the, the one part of this project was, trying to get this information out to women, you know, through Planned Parenthood um, clinics in Montana. But the other piece of it was the organizing piece. 
Um, and that was trying, you know, organizing support among um, Montanans, particularly women, to support uh, chemical policy reform. And when we say chemical policy reform, that's just referring to updating um, the federal law that regulates toxic chemicals that right now is so weak that it allows chemicals like phthalates and triclosan and BPA in, you know, household products that we come into contact with every day. So we wanted to get women more involved with this issue, you know, with the goal of just raising this issue among our elected officials in Montana. And one of the ways we did that is through uh, holding some free movie screenings in Montana of The Human Experiment. This is a documentary that's actually narrated by Sean Penn, the actor. Um, but, but it was really great because it gives a nice overview of the problem. And it also has, um, in some ways, kind of a particular focus on, on reproductive health. And so at the film, there's a great kind of introduction to the issue. It gets you fired up. Um, we have petitions that folks could sign asking the Montana get delegation to support strong, you know, federal policy reform that's going to protect us from toxic chemicals. And the other thing that Planned Parenthood is doing as part of this joint project is using our materials um, to do some organizing on, on campus um, through, like, tabling events, for, for example, where we can also put out our petition and get young people to, um, you know, involved in this issue by signing the petition. And they're also working with their members to write, you know, letters to the editor, um, to our congressional delegation, asking them to support strong chemical policy reform. And, you know, that's something we do with our members, but I think the reproductive health angle, just, it, it's just a different, um, it's just a different angle. It's kind of a different way to approach the, the issue. Um, so it made a lot of sense to, to do this outreach with Planned Parenthood. And just in conclusion, you know, we feel like this first year of this joint project has been successful, and, and we look forward to continuing to build on this work next year. Um, and we also, I'd really love to see it expand to other Planned Parenthood, you know, in the country, um, even if it's just material distribution through the clinics. That's just an, kind of an important first step. Um, so with that, I'm going to open it up for questions. So I'm going to um, unmute everybody. Let's see. And then we have some questions in the chat box that I'll get to. The conference has been unmuted. Okay. So just to start, uh, Elizabeth, I saw that you answered some of these questions, but maybe we could um, you just say it out loud for everybody. But... Oh, this is one question actually for you, Alex, that we get a lot is, have we done any research on Diva Cups? Right. This is a, a really good question, and it makes me think that we really need to do something about this. The question is revolving um, <coughs> Diva Cups or menstrual cups, which uh, are kind of these little silicone uh, devices to collect menstrual fluid. Um, you know, the, we have looked. There is some research out there. There isn't a lot out there, which is why we haven't sort of really pursued it. Um, and most of the research I've found seems to be sponsored by the companies that create these products. Um, but the, you know, the research that I've seen has all been very sort of positive in terms of um, not having impacts. They're generally made of silicone, which is relatively inert. Um, substance, and I haven't seen any um, kind of red flags as to, you know, why these um, particular products would be, you know, dangerous or toxic in some way. Um, so we probably need to put some sort of information out there about what, you know, what we do know, but there isn't a lot of data, um, sort of objective data to go on at this point. Thanks, Alex. The other question we have for you, <laughs> for you and also maybe Elizabeth can um, also um, chime in, but is it any, if we have any research on the impact of hormones and chemicals in food that impact reproductive health? Another really good question. Um, I, you know, there are certainly a lot of uh, potential links there. There are a lot of hormones, a lot of chemicals in food um, that are directly affecting our health. It's not something that, that Women's Voices for the Earth has, has uh, focused on, unfortunately. Um, and so, you know, it's a huge, huge area to take on, uh, but there is information out there, but it's not something that we've worked on. And I don't know of any research. This oh. is Elizabeth. Okay, thanks. 
Um, the other question we had is just where does the research come from for the stat of 25% of African American girls are starting puberty at the age of seven? Um, so I, I put in there a link to a blog that I did on the issue, and there's a new book okay. that came out in February called The New Puberty, and that's where I drew it from, but they base it on um, several different studies. So it's pretty, it's, um, my recollection, and Alex, you probably know much better than I do, um, was that it, it has been repeated in several studies, so it's not, it, it's, I think it's fairly well accepted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I'd agree with that. Great, and thanks for sending that link around. That's also in the chat box for those of you that are interested. And there was just another question which you, you answered in the chat box. Um, is the condom research complete and what, is, what did the research show or indicate? Yeah, so the research is done and um, again, I put a link to the report in the chat box. Um, and basically what we did was um, we tested 24 different brands of condoms for um, whether or not they release nitrosamines, which is a, um, which is a carcinogen. And basically what we found was that a third didn't release any um, nitrosamines, a third released some, and a third released levels that we found concerning. Um, the good news from, so basically it was a mixed bag, but the bottom line was, um, so we wanted the information because we thought it was important, it had been raised in lots of different venues. I mean, the bottom line is people should still use condoms. They're still extremely safe, they're extremely effective. Um, but the fact that they're, you know, a third of the condoms that we tested did not release nitrosamines is clear evidence that we don't need nitrosamines in the condoms in order to make them um, effective. So right. we're trying to work with manufacturers to commit to reducing or eliminating nitrosamines um, because the problem with it's it's not that the it's not that the using a condom is going to you know, cause cancer, it's that we're exposed to nitrosamines in lots of different places. And this is one place where we don't need to be exposed to it. And for all the reasons that Alex was talking about, um, about um, women's reproductive health being especially sensitive with the mucus and the, you know, it's, it's especially a place where we don't need to be exposed to chemicals where we don't need to. But what's, what I think, like from the RHTP standpoint, what is really interesting about this issue is, you know, it's a really careful balance for us, right? I mean, people, we, we don't want to do anything that would discourage people from using condoms. Um, at the same time, you know, we, you know, we give these condom manufacturers our business and they shouldn't be putting nitrosamines in them if they don't want to, um, if, if, they, if they don't have to, and they don't have to. So um, we thought it was really, it was important to get the information out, but we also did so in a fairly low key way because we wanted to work more with manufacturers to try and remove nitrosamines voluntarily. Great, thanks Elizabeth. And just we're kind of getting a little background noise, so if you're not talking or if you don't want to ask a question, if you could put yourself on mute, that would be great. Um, a question here are the fact sheets you showed online. Um, they are online. They're on our website, www.womensvoices.org, um, on our fact sheet page. They're actually not the co-branded Planned Parenthood um, version. They're the same fact sheets, but they just, you know, our, have our logo on them. Um, I'm not sure if Planned Parenthood has plans to post these fact sheets on their on their own website, um, but you you can find those online. And we also have a lot of the feminine care wallet cards, which you can get in touch with me, and we can always mail you some if you wanted to distribute them. Any other questions? Other questions? Here we go. We have one. Oh, great. Thank you, Anne, for that nice comment. 
Well, if there aren't any further questions, I'm going to go ahead and stop the webinar. But first, I really want to thank Elizabeth and Alex for being on um, and speaking with us today about this really important issue. I will be sending out a link to the recording uh, to everyone that you feel free to distribute and share with your networks. And of course, you know, feel free to get in touch with Alex or myself or Elizabeth if you have any um, further questions. But thank you again for joining the webinar, and I hope you have a good day. Thanks. Thank you.